The question to be addressed is how many of us are equipped with the skill set and the mindset to be able to deal with the patient who presents to you with vitreous in the anterior chamber in the post-operative period. It could be one of either two scenarios. Either you've had a complication, you've had either a zonal dialysis or a posterior capsular rupture intraoperatively, manage the patient the best you could, but you still find vitreous in the anterior chamber. The second scenario could be that it was a fairly uneventful surgery and you're not quite sure how this happened. It's not very uncommon to see a scenario like this. And finally, it could be trauma. It could be a subtle or it could be an obvious trauma to the operated eye early in the post-operative period that can result in a similar scenario of disturbed vitreous in the anterior chamber. In either of the three case scenarios, something needs to be done because you cannot leave vitreous in the anterior chamber. So what should be our approach to a patient who presents to you with vitreous in the anterior chamber? Here are the various things that we need to consider. One, what exactly possibly caused it? Now the other important considerations are the following. What else is going on in the eye? Where exactly has the vitreous come in from? It could be ideally one of two routes. Either there is a posterior capsular rupture through which there is a vitreous prolapse anteriorly, or there is a zonular dialysis beyond which the vitreous has entered the anterior chamber. The next question to be asked is, how stable is the intraocular lens? Is it still centered? Is it still in its place? Is it displaced? Is it stable and is it likely to remain in its position? Third, we need to also wonder what's going on at the back of the eye. Is there damage to the vitreous base? Is there damage to the retina? Are there retinal holes and breaks following a trauma? Is there a vitreous hemorrhage? And what is the status of the macula? We also need to consider what is the status of inflammation in the eye? Is there raised intraocular pressure which might show up as an absence of Desmet's folds and corneal edema? Or is there any associated infection? If required, any investigation such as an OCT or an ultrasound or a UBM may need to be performed to add light to understand what's going on in the rest of the eye in greater detail and with more clarity. It is very important that we sit the patient down and explain to them exactly what's going on. We need to counsel them in detail regarding the following. 1. What exactly is going on with the eye? 2. The unpredictability of the outcome when we take the patient up to do any corrective surgical procedure. 3. The need for any VR intervention and possibility of leaving the patient either aphakic or even requiring a second surgery at a later date. A guarded visual prognosis needs to be emphasized upon. Give the patients and the relatives time to think about this and come back giving you an informed consent to go ahead with the corrective surgical procedure. It is then when we take the patient up for surgery. At the outset, it is very important that each and every one of us as cataract surgeons should have in our OT armamentarium a well-established, well-functioning anterior vitrectomy unit. Not only that, it is essential that we have a team of staff that are able to set it up in almost no time. We now start with the setup of the anterior vitrectomy unit. The vitrectomy cutter is taken out from its sterile packaging and placed on the trolley. Now this is a vitrectomy cutter. One end of it is the cutter itself. This as you can see is a 20 gauge vitrectomy cutter. The cutter is connected to two tubings, both of which end in two points. The green end goes and connects to the vitrectomy point on the console and this is the white one which connects to the aspiration line as you will shortly see. The aspiration tubing is disengaged from the back of the phaco probe and it is connected to the aspiration point on the cutter. The green knob is then taken and connected to the vitrectomy point on the console. 
Having done this, it's now time to prime the vitrectomy cutter. So we go to the console and hit vitrectomy prime. At the same time, we take the vitrectomy cutter and introduce it into some kind of a water bath. We hit prime on the console and this is how we end up priming the vitrectomy cutter. Now the vitrectomy unit has two settings. This is the cut IA and this irrigation cut aspiration is used for cutting the vitreous. In the irrigation cut IA, we work with a cut rate of anywhere between 700 as in this particular machine it offers up to 1200 cuts per minute and a vacuum of 150 millimeters of mercury. The next is the irrigation aspiration cut. When we work with these settings, we are no longer relying on the cutter to actually cut the vitreous. However, when the vitreous has been cut, in order to just aspirate the cortex, we might go on to the irrigation aspiration cut. In order to intermittently just aspirate the cortex. Having understood the vitrectomy setup, we now move to understanding the preparation of the triamcinolone acetonide injection, which we use to delineate the vitreous. Triamcinolone astonide comes in a 1 ml vial. It comes in a concentration of 40 mg in 1 ml. The concentration that we require in order to delineate the vitreous is 4 mg in 0.1 ml, which we further dilute 1 in 5 and here's how we do it. 0.1 ml of triamcinolone astonide containing 4 mg of the drug is aspirated into a tubercline syringe. This 0.1 ml is now further diluted 1 in 5 using either ringer lactate or BSS. This diluted solution is now ready for its intracameral use. Let's now move to the clinical cases. Case 1. This patient presented to us day 1 postoperatively with a clinical appearance like this. A pupil slightly peaked at the 10 o'clock position and a strand of vitreous going towards the side port incision. There was no other abnormality noted. The IOL looked stable and we could not really see a posterior capsular rent. At this point, we took the decision to use a pair of intraocular scissors to cut the vitreous stand. Here's what we did. Since the surgery was not done by me, I chose to make incisions which would make it very comfortable for me to perform this procedure. I'd like you to note how the incision that is taken needs to be wide enough to allow for the easy entry of an intraocular scissors. Moreover, the incision opposite the area of the vitreous prolapse is going to be used to introduce intraocular forceps to gain easy access to the strand that needs to be cut. Having done that, diluted triamcinolone astonide is injected into the anterior chamber to clearly delineate this vitreous stand and also to pick up any other vitreous disturbance should it exist. Clearly you can see that there is a single strand of vitreous at say the 10 o'clock position. After fixating the globe, an intraocular scissors is introduced from the 1 o'clock paracentesis incision and it goes and cuts the strand in one snap. The scissors are now just passed under the iris at the same location and I just cut a little bit there in order to cut any disturbed vitreous should it be there even under the iris. At the end of this, we introduce some intracameral pilocarpine and watch how the pupil constricts. Should there have been any residual vitreous tag, you would have seen a peaking of the pupil. A round central pupil signifies that the strand has been adequately cut and there is no other disturbed vitreous in the anterior chamber. At the end of that, the pilocarpine is now washed out and the wounds hydrated, giving us an optimal end result.
So for a single vitreous stand that has prolapsed, it's quite possible to negate the need of using an entire anterior vitrectomy setup in order to cut it. A pair of intraocular scissors introduced from a point away from the area of the vitreous prolapse is almost always adequate in severing it appropriately. We now move to the second case. This patient who had undergone a manual SICS cataract surgery and had a rigid IOL implanted in the capsular bag, sustained a blunt injury in the early post-operative period and presented the next day with an appearance like this. There are blood clots in the anterior chamber, the superior iris seems to be missing and there is prolapsed vitreous in the anterior chamber superiorly. The IOL, however, appears to be stable and at this point I can't really tell whether or not there is a posterior capsular rupture or a zonular dialysis. We start with examining the SICS wound for evidence of any prolapsed iris or prolapsed vitreous. Next, I introduce triamcinolone astenide into the anterior chamber to delineate the disturbed vitreous. After washing it out, it becomes amply evident that there is a significant vitreous disturbance in the anterior chamber. I now proceed to performing a limited anterior vitrectomy. In order to do so, I introduce the irrigation through one of the side ports and a 20 gauge cutter is introduced through one of the paracentesis incisions and you can see how we then proceed to performing a limited anterior vitrectomy and cutting all the disturbed vitreous from the anterior chamber. The cut rate in this case is kept at about 800 cuts per minute and the vacuum no more than 150 millimeters of mercury. Some more diluted triamcinolone astenide is then injected in the anterior chamber and then subsequently washed out with a view of delineating any more residual vitreous that might still be there in the anterior chamber. This residual vitreous that you can see is once more removed with the help of the anterior vitrectomy. This is what you will see in this part of the video. Clearly what seems to be visible is that there is a large superior posterior capsular end through which a significant amount of vitreous is prolapsing. I now proceed to cutting the superiorly prolapsed vitreous. At the end of the anterior vitrectomy, both of the instruments are withdrawn from the eye. I now introduce some viscoelastic into the anterior chamber and then proceed to evaluate the stability of the IOL. What I can see is that the IOL seems to be quite stable within the capsular bag. However, I choose to now rotate the IOL into the ciliary sulcus to afford slightly more stability. Now, I have a resultant stable rigid IOL in the ciliary sulcus. We now move to address the missing iris. Clearly, the iris doesn't seem to have prolapsed through the wound, so could it be stuck within the scleral tunnel? Under viscoelastic cover, and after affording adequate counter pressure, I use the intraocular forceps to pull on the iris and I'm able to successfully draw it out from within the scleral tunnel into the anterior chamber. The excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber is then removed using the bimanual irrigation aspiration.
One has to take care that at this point you do not let any of the fluid go into the posterior segment which has the potential of hydrating the vitreous and causing some more to prolapse. Intracameral pilocarpine is then injected into the anterior chamber and this is followed by the introduction of intracameral air. As you can see, the superior edge of the optic still seems visible. So now with the help of a Sinsky hook, I rotate the IOL a little bit more to be able to achieve the superior optic edge cover. Following the introduction of Samo intracambral pilocarpine, you can see I have a nice, small, round pupil. The skull tunnel is now sutured, the sutures are then buried, and this is followed by the conjunctival closure with the help of cautery. And at the end, this is the end result that we achieved. An anterior chamber free of vitreous, a nice small round pupil, and a stable IUL in the ciliary sulcus. We now move to the third case. This patient underwent a fairly uneventful phacoemulsification procedure. Day one, the patient was doing well. The patient then presented to us two weeks after surgery. She was asymptomatic and had a visual acuity of six by nine. On clinical examination, we saw a stable IOL, a large superior posterior capsular rupture, and a significantly large vitreous blob in the anterior chamber. A decision was taken to perform an anterior vitrectomy, look for the stability of the IOL and then take further decisions on table. After a proper counselling session, the patient was taken up for surgery. And here's how we managed this case. After an adequate peribulbar block, we start with taking the incisions. The incisions are always wide enough to allow for a vitrector and are placed at such a position that will allow for the ease of insertion of the anterior vitrectomy instruments. We then proceed to the intracameral injection of diluted triamcinolonastenide to delineate the disturbed vitreous. You will now be able to visualize the anterior vitrectomy procedure. We start with cutting the vitreous which is outside the wound, then within the wound and finally within the anterior chamber. The anterior vitrectomy settings that we use here are a cut rate of 700 cuts per minute and a vacuum of 150 millimeters of mercury. Whilst proceeding with the anterior vitrectomy, we have to ensure at all times that the IOL still remains stable. Whilst proceeding with the anterior vitrectomy, note how the vitrector largely stays in its place, cuts the vitreous before moving forward to cut any more vitreous in any other part of the eye. At all times, we need to ensure the stability of the IOL. Some more triumcin alone is injected into the eye to ascertain the presence or the absence of any more disturbed vitreous. The restal vitreous is further cleared by performing some more anterior vitrectomy. Whilst performing the anterior vitrectomy, note how I accidentally catch the iris which results in a little bit of a sphincterectomy. The only problem that this is going to cause is a cosmetically not so rounded pupil. At the point where we've caught onto the iris, you would have a tiny notch in the pupil which you will see towards the end of the surgery. You might notice how more and more vitreous seems to be prolapsing into the anterior chamber. It's important to ensure that we clear all the vitreous from the anterior chamber.
I now proceed to evaluate how stable is this single piece monofocal IOL which still is within the capsular bag. In view of the significantly large posterior capsular rupture involving almost the upper two-third of the posterior capsule, a decision is then taken to explant the IOL. The plan is to create a small scleral tunnel, almost 4 mm in size, through which the IOL will be held and removed and a new three-piece monofocal IOL will be implanted and placed securely within the ciliary sulcus. This is what you'll see in this part of the procedure. Once the tunnel is created, with the help of two Sinsky hooks, the IOL is negotiated and brought out into the anterior chamber, after which it is held via the scleral tunnel created with the help of a McPherson's and brought out of the eye. A check anterior vitrectomy is then once more performed to ensure that the removal of the IOL did not result in any further vitreous disturbance. Having completed this, a three-piece IOL is now injected and placed securely within the ciliary sulcus. Note how each of the haptics is dialed into the ciliary sulcus. The excessive viscoelastic is now cleared from the anterior chamber. As I've mentioned earlier, it is important to ensure that we do not let fluid go back into the posterior segment at this point because it has the propensity to then further hydrate more vitreous and result in more of a vitreous prolapse. After ensuring all the viscoelastic is removed, the instruments are then removed from the eye. This is followed by injection of a little bit of pilocarpine into the eye to bring the pupil down. Notice the little notch that has resulted from having cut the pupillary border with the anterior vitrectomy accidentally. We now proceed with the gentle stromal hydration. Following the completion of the stromal hydration, we introduce some air into the anterior chamber. The wound is secured by performing a bipolar cautery. And finally, this is the end result that we have achieved. This brings us to the end of the tutorial discussing the approach and the strategies of managing a patient who presents to us with a post-operative vitreous loss. It has been my endeavor to make this subject easy to understand and with the view that each of us surgeons should be able to manage this complication should we see it in the post-operative period. I truly hope that you find this tutorial useful. Thank you.